Now, a lot of people associate eating meat uh, with being a man and eating fruits and vegetables with being a woman. And unfortunately, this idea has sort of become pervasive in our society today. And many men, myself included, back in the day, used to make the statement, oh, you know, I don't want to switch over to a plant-strong diet. I don't want to eat a vegetarian or a vegan diet because that's what women do. I'm a man and men, men eat meat. So, you know, first question for you is, why do you think that this, this idea that men eat meat and women eat fruits and vegetables, where did this start in the first place? And why has it become so pervasive in our society today? Well, it's, it is very interesting. And I actually don't know exactly where it all originated from. I mean, I'm sure a lot of it is, you know, marketing that's happened over the last 50, 75 years. Um, but in, in, as far as, you know, to my knowledge, no particular food is um, masculine or feminine, right? Um, and we just somehow label something as being more masculine or more feminine. The reality is, is that the, I like to look at foods as being strong foods or weak foods. And I think we all want to be eating strong foods and the strongest foods, as we now know, uh, that are going to be the best for you and they're going to fuel you and allow you to be the best version of yourself are going to be your whole plant strong foods. So it's going to be your fruits, your vegetables, your whole intact grains, your myriad of legumes. And, uh, you know, if I, if I was talking to a man, I'd say, listen, you know, if you want to be the, the best virile version of yourself, uh, then this is the way you want to eat. If you want to be, you know, more of a, um, a subdued version of yourself that is going to potentially, uh, go down the path of, uh, erectile dysfunction and you know strokes and heart attacks and uh insulin rejection and some of these other things then you know then you know have all the meat and dairy and cheese you want but uh to me the the, you know, the manliest way to eat is when you're actually going against the grain when you're not going uh with the herd and you kind of you take in all the information the knowledge you assimilate it and then you make a very well-educated um, decision based upon the information. And once you have the information, to me, it makes it very, very difficult if you're a educated woman, if you're an educated male, to continue to consume these disease-promoting, um, problematic foods. So um, anyway, to me, it's a slam dunk, you right? Right. So, so go back to in your collegiate days as an, as a collegiate swimmer or as a professional triathlete just after that, did you also make this association where you thought that you had to eat meat in order to be a top performing athlete, uh, in order to perform and recover quickly? Yeah. So I, I, yeah. So I swam at the university of Texas at Austin. I went through on a swimming scholarship. Um, I swam there, uh, from 1982 to 86 and I ate, at the athletic training table with the football players, with the basketball players, the baseball players, the tennis players, all these scholarship athletes. And it was chicken fried steak. It was filet mignon. It was burgers. Uh, it was soft serve ice cream. It was French fried potatoes. Uh, you know, we'd have a little, maybe a little salad with ranch dressing at the very, very end of, you know, the, 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 the food bar, it was atrocious. It was bacon and eggs, you know, and pancakes with butter. And uh, unfortunately, I and all the other athletes, we didn't know any better, right? I mean, my father's research at the Cleveland Clinic he didn't get into full swing until 1985, 86. And so I was finishing up my, my athletic career at the University of Texas then. And, uh, and it wasn't until I stepped out of that uh, arena uh, when I graduated from University of Texas at Austin that and I started cooking for myself that I was able to escape from all the meat and all the cheese and all the dairy and all the the weak food that when you're that young 
you can you can get away with it. You know, you, you're you're so young that it is truly amazing what you can get away with. But um, you know, I God, if I if I knew then what I know now, I would do things a lot differently. Yeah, so that's my next actual follow-up question. If you were actually a plant-strong athlete in your collegiate days, how do you think that would have changed your performance as an athlete? Oh, dude, man, I would have been a triple gold medalist. Come on. <laughs> do you really think that it would have made that much of a difference? Tell us exactly how. In your performance, in your recovery, in your ability to uh, go for longer distances, in power output, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. So it would have helped with all those things. It would have helped my, with my recovery – because I'd be consuming all these, you know, wonderful anti-inflammatory, uh, antioxidant, phytonutrient-laden foods that wouldn't have been as um, as, as crippling uh, as far as speed. Um, you're just you're consuming a smarter, stronger fuel, and uh, you're going to get more more oxygen to working muscles because of the nitric oxide. And, um, and all my vessels and my, my, the fact that my endothelial cells are just like alive and functioning at their best and producing all that nitric oxide, uh, my vessels will be allowing more blood flow to all these working muscles. And then when it comes to, um, uh, you know, I'd be doing everything better. I'd be sleeping better. I would be um, recovering better. I would be... Uh, I'd be stronger. Uh, yeah, just it'd be, it would it, be, it, you know, again, it would be a slam dunk um, because I wouldn't be eating these weak, <laughs> problematic foods that you know, at that age, 19, 20, 21, you can, you can get away with, but uh, you're still not doing, doing the best that you can for your athletic performance. I fully agree with you. I remember when I transitioned to a plant-based diet, I could feel it within the first week. Yeah. And not only did I see differences in my blood glucose and my insulin use, but uh, I did notice that this sort of like muscle tightness that was present in my lower back for a long period of time seemed to just kind of like dissipate. And then when I would go out and perform exercise, I could perform for a longer period of time. I was less sore following that. And as a result of that, I could go out and exercise uh, without having to rest as much. And this kept on compounding on itself over and over and over again. And within a short period of time, I was like, wow, why have I not been doing this for the last 20 years? This could have been a complete game changer. Yeah, yeah, totally. And as you know, um, you know, this last July, at the age of 56, I, I set the world record uh, in the 200 meter backstroke for men 55 to 59. Um, and I, you know, I look around at people my age, and it's amazing how your cardiovascular system diminishes, your respiratory system kind of starts to diminish, and it's really hard to have that kind of a uh, a maximum output and without your system starting to shut down. And I I can tell you right now, I attribute seventy five percent of that world record to my my fuel right to the plant strong fuel um now i also you know worked out super consistently super hard um super smart and did everything i needed to do but um i still have a body that loves going hard and has no problem with testing its limits yeah, that's a great way to think about it. So you set the world record, just to make sure we're, everybody understands exactly what happened. You set the world record for 200-meter backstroke for men aged right. 50 to 59, and you swam it in 2 minutes, 21, 55 to 59, thank you. You swam that in 2 minutes, 21 seconds, and some change. Actually, no, I, went, I, I did it again a month later and went 220.8. 220.8. Wow. So you set the world record twice, effectively. You beat your yep, own record. So I, yep. So I broke the record, and then I broke my own record a month later at a better venue, a, a faster pool with a lot more competition. Yeah. Yeah, that's incredible. So, you know, at a recent uh, plant stock event, I went to swim to get a workout in the morning. Rip joined in the pool 20 minutes later, and he was doing his own workout. 
And he was two lanes over from me. And as soon as he hit the pool, I just went underwater and sat there and looked at him. You swim like a fish, Rip. I was, un, I was flabbergasted at how fast your body moves. So when this guy tells you he's moving fast, believe him. <laughs> no uh-huh. <question> about it. <laughs> it well, was it, was fun. it was fun swimming with you that day. And uh, listen, you're, you're, no, you're no slouch yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I loved, I, loved, I loved looking over and seeing you getting after it, too. That was fun. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Um, but, I mean, your, your point still stands here, which is that the traditional course of action for most people living a standard American lifestyle, if you will, is that their body deteriorates over time. Their muscle mass goes down. Their cardiovascular endurance goes down. Uh, their athletic performance goes down, and their recovery goes up. But yet you're saying that eating a plant-strong diet has actually turned you in the opposite direction and you actually have better cardiovascular health or you're able to consistently challenge your cardiovascular health and potentially even make more gains over the course of time. Yes, I would, I would say that you know, I, I, am, I am not like I was when I was in my 20s or my 30s, but um, I am doing everything I can to fight back mother, father time, and I think one of the best ways to do that is with, right, a, a whole food, plant strong diet, and then consistent workouts, right? Consistent um, movement. So are there any side effects associated with eating a plant strong diet, especially for men? Now, there's this sort of pervasive idea that you're going to be either protein deficient you're going to experience muscle loss or even have reduced sex drive. True, right. false. Tell us. Well, I would say all those things are false. Um, I can tell you when it comes to sex drive, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's funny how a lot of men, you, you get up into your maybe your 40s, 50s, 60s, and not only do you have a loss of sex drive, but you also – uh, I think the latest, the latest statistics that I heard is that like close to 50% of men over the age of 40 are suffering from some sort of erectile dysfunction. Wow. And, um, well, just speaking personally, I can tell you that is absolutely not the case. Right. And, um, there's, there's no issues with testosterone levels or sex drive or or uh raising the flag whatsoever um when it comes to you know muscle mass um you know so much of that is just being able to you got to stress your muscles right you got to do some sort of weight bearing exercise you also want to make sure that you're getting depending upon your weight and your size you're getting enough protein right for 90 percent of americans that's not going to be an issue but if you're really trying to bulk up and get and get big, then you want to you want to make sure you're getting 1.6 to 2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. Um, I can tell you for myself because I'm typically consuming 3,500 to 4,000 calories a day. I've never counted how many grams of protein I'm getting. It's just not a it's not a concern of mine. And I have never been eaten up with trying to get big. Uh, I actually like being, being nimble, being a good size for running, biking, swimming. Uh, I, I don't need to be, to be big. Um, but for people, men that want to be big, women that want to be big, then you just need to make sure you're hitting the weights hard, <clears throat> doing the weight-bearing exercises. <clears throat> and then also, to boot, it'll be helpful to make sure you're getting that you know, 1.6 to 2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. Um, yeah. Was there something else you asked me on the tail end of that one? I'm, mm-hmm. I no, think you mentioned the, the sex drive. You mentioned the, the, the muscle mass. What was the last one? Oh. Uh, reduced muscle mass, reduced sex drive, and just loss of – no, that's it. Those are, those are the only two. And those are sort of yeah. common myths that are floating around. And I hear this all the time from people who say, oh, you're eating a plant-based diet. Uh, did you know yeah. that, you know, your sex drive is going to go down over time? And I say, you know, show me the evidence. It doesn't, there doesn't seem to be any <laughs> actual valid scientific evidence in support of that, even though there may be some anecdotes, which are completely different than what the actual science shows. 